recording and I will start the webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Caribbean Corporate Investment for Resilience East Caribbean Business Challenge St. Lucia Launch Event. We are grateful for your time, input, and questions today. Uh, my name is Caroline Logan. I'll be our moderator throughout the session. I'm also the Senior Project Manager for the Blended Finance Mechanism um, component of the CCIR, and you all will learn a little bit about that today. As we give everyone a moment to get connected, we'd love to get to know you in the chat box. So on the bottom of your toolbar, you'll see a number of tools next to the little participants icon. There's a chat window, and we would love it if you would please enter your name, your organization, and one thing you'd like to learn today. And I'll go ahead and do that now. All right, so as we um, wait for everyone to join, I know many of us are frequent Zoom users, but we really want this session to be as interactive as possible. And so we wanna draw your attention to a couple of tools we'll use throughout the webinar today. The first is the raise hand function. So we are in a webinar format, but we still have the capability and want to encourage people to come off mute, to share their thoughts, to ask questions. So if you do have a question, uh, at the bottom of your toolbar, you'll see the little raise hand function. Please use that throughout. Uh, we'll uh, enable your audio so that when you um, come off to speak, everyone will be able to hear you. Um, in addition to the raise hand function, we'll be using both the chat box and the Q&A box. So you can see everyone's entering in their names, their organizations, uh, and you know if, if you have one thing you wanna learn today, please feel free to drop that in the chat as well. Um, the Q&A is really for our team to collect your questions throughout. So um, if we're in a section, we can't get to your question at that time, we will do our best to address it later in the workshop. Um, whereas, you know, the chat box is really meant for that live dialogue. So responding to one another, um, we might have some prompting questions that we encourage you to push in the chat. But again, if you just have a question you'd like to submit to our team, please do so in the Q&A box. All right, wonderful. And with that, we really appreciate everyone that's uh, introducing themselves in the chat box. Again, for those that are just joining, my name is Caroline Logan. I'm a project manager with the CCIR Blended Finance Mechanism. Thank you for being here today. So we'll go ahead now and dive in. If we move to the next, I'll give you an overview of our agenda. So we just welcomed you all. Um, we're gonna hear some opening remarks from Nikazi Green. She's our private sector engagement advisor with USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Then we will uh, provide an overview of the CCIR and the Eastern Caribbean Business Resili uh, Resilience Challenge more specifically as well as the coalition, which will support uh, that effort. Uh, we'll talk about the general importance of resilience investments, and we're gonna hear from a guest speaker from Tropical Shipping um, to hear his perspective on resilience in the region. And then finally, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of the application process. So how you can apply to the Eastern Caribbean Resilience Challenge, uh, how we'll evaluate those applicants, what's the timeline, things like that and then we'll leave time for Q&A. All right, so if we move into the next slide, um, and the next, we're gonna tell you briefly about our team. So there's a series, there are a series of teams that work together under the CCIR umbrella. Collaborate up on the left side here alongside our partners, the Pan American Development Foundation and Total Impact Capital. We lead the CCIR blended finance mechanism, uh, which has led to the business resilience challenge that you'll hear about today. 
In parallel and in collaboration with our team, you'll also hear from leaders at the Global Knowledge Initiative. They're really dedicated to the design of a CCR coalition, which is an inclusive space for innovators, leaders, entrepreneurs, change agents, and problem solvers from the region to come together and collaborate across boundaries. So you'll hear more about that today. So with that, it is my pleasure to pass it to Nikazi Green. Again, Nikazi is our private sector engagement advisor with USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Over to you, Nikazi. Hello, good morning. Um, I wanna thank you all on behalf of USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for taking the time out to meet with us and discuss our exciting new initiatives underway with the Caribbean Corporate Investment for Resilience. Um, first, the just a brief overview, the CCR coalition um, was born from a period of significant stakeholder engagement led by the Global Knowledge Initiative, where regional cross-sector leaders, um, particularly the private sector, uh, identified the need for coordinated private sector action to achieve the shared goal of a more disaster and climate resilient region. The CCR coalition is a private sector led platform for collaboration around complex systematic challenges to disaster preparedness and response. Several opportunities and solutions were identified through this, this coalition um, during the discovery phase and one of which was the access to finance. So underneath that CCR coalition umbrella, the CCR blended finance mechanism was created. This engagement is led by Collaborate Up, the Pan American Development Foundation and Total Impact Capital. They support the development and the scaling of projects that bring us closer to our, our goal of increasing disaster resilience in the region. When we use the term disaster resilience in relationship to business, we're referring to businesses ability to recover quickly from disasters. The CCR blended finance mechanism aims to use blended finance approaches to mobilize capital for investments in disaster risk reduction activities. The mechanism will utilize a grant from USAID to crowd in outside investment and buy down the risk for investors. This effort will also provide technical assistance to small and medium sized enterprises and other organizations with initiatives that contribute to disaster resilience in the Caribbean. A sustainable, blended a sustainable blended capital financing vehicle will support greater private sector engagement and, its, and given its potential to scale, will address financing needs of local entrepreneurs and initiatives in a meaningful way. This blended finance model will provide support to projects to make them more bankable, scalable, and sustainable. As you all know, small island developing states in the Eastern Caribbean suffer yearly losses from storm damages equivalent to 17% of their GDP. This frequent, these frequent disasters further stress already strange public and private sector resources. After these shocks, nations must rebuild with limited resources and limited capacity just to get back to the baseline. These efforts are particularly important for USA Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, BHA, as we have prioritized localization and community-led approaches to address the challenges of disasters and climate-related events. As a component of the CCR blended finance mechanism and in partnership with the CCR coalition, we are excited to announce the Eastern Caribbean Business Resilience Challenge launching in St. Lucia, which is why we're all here today. Our pilot in St. Lucia will test how best we use blended finance, combining USA funding with private funding in financing that can be repaid to the recipient to improve disaster res resiliency. We need you. In addition to building a pipeline of applicants, your role as partners in this effort is key. We are looking to engage on island experts who can connect us to promising initiatives, lend technical expertise or provide financing. The goal of this, the launch of this event is to help shed light on the launch of this challenge and the rolling application process currently underway. We look forward to answering your questions about the challenge as well as the application process. Your candid feedback throughout this workshop will also prepare us for the wider regional approach following the pilot in St. Lucia. On behalf of USAID, thank you for your continued support, whether you're applying for funding in St. Lucia or committed to the larger disaster resilience ecosystem. 
We are grateful for your time, input, and engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Nikazi, for those really helpful and framing opening remarks. Um, I want to now move to our next speaker. So we'll hear from Monica, who's uh, a network designer and facilitator with the Global Knowledge Initiative. She's going to provide some, some framing remarks about the CCIR coalition. Over to you, Monica. Good morning, everybody. Could you please advance to the next slide? So I work with Global Knowledge Initiative, and the Global Knowledge Initiative is a US-based nonprofit with a mission to activate collaborative networks to deliver innovative solutions that build more resilient systems. So that means that we work on a wide range of complex challenges, some of which include disaster and climate resilience, from the community level to the global level, all with the effort to build systems that are more responsive, inclusive, adaptive, and that deliver better outcomes for people and planet. We work in accompaniment with stakeholders in these various settings to foster and to enable diverse perspectives, capacities, and resources to enable cross-pollination between people. And this is because we believe that the knowledge to foster a more resilient future already exists. It already exists within the wisdom of the communities that we work with but the gap lies in how we connect those individuals, how those individuals connect with each other who hold this ingenuity so that we can do more together better. So next slide. So through this intention of, of enabling the ingenuity uh, came a, uh, several months of stakeholder engagement. So over the course of about 15 months, as uh, Nikasi and Carolyn mentioned, we held discussions with stakeholders in the region to understand what's working and what's not in building private sector roles, private sector leadership, and public-private collaboration towards disaster resilience and response in the region. And regional leaders identified significant barriers to cross-sectoral collaboration on resilience challenges. And most importantly for the creation of the coalition, was that there was lack of opportunity for the private and the public sector to coordinate and to collaborate meaningfully across sectors and institutions in order to strengthen this resilience. So from this challenge arose the desire for a coalition to be formed to serve as the platform for these private public sector partnerships to be initiated, to form, and then to explore where collective action might lie. Next slide. And I'll just keep talking while the slide transitions. So the coalition holds the long-term or North Star vision of a more resilient Caribbean region, along with what we're calling our Near Star vision, which is increased collective action to support and foster disaster response and climate resilience. And so we use this North Star vision to orient the multi-sector cross-sectoral members and supporters and the public and also to generate the multi-strategy action that's needed in order for us to reach this vision for change. We really want this vision to be uh, inspire, inspire and activate collaboration, to be able to bring a clear purpose and in order to resonate broader meaning in people's day-to-day -day work who are working on related topics. And when we hit the sweet spot, we hope that it inspires us to think beyond single programmatic or single organizational solutions and work towards this cross-cutting, cross-sector solutions that can add up to our shared vision. So next slide. In order to achieve these near and North Star visions, we see the following as really being critical. So coalition members can share and access knowledge, information, skills, tools, resources, projects, best practices, and stories through shared platforms that they have ownership and participation in. That relationships and connections are developed or strengthened across sectors, organizations, initiatives, and projects. And that capacities are strengthened in order to support the integration of knowledge into organizational level plans. So through hands-on and in-depth training, 
It's in order to make resilience a priority at the organizational level. And that more opportunities exist for private and public sector coordination and collaboration through facilitating the coordination and collaboration of these institutions in order to act collectively. So next slide. So in the interim, uh, while we're getting the coalition formed and launched, GKI will continue to play uh, the role of an interim backbone. And what this essentially means is that we are the convener and the facilitator and coordinator in partnership with local leaders in the region. Um, we'll be doing targeted private and public sector stakeholder engagement and outreach and really help to activate all of those elements within the mission. Next slide. So finally, this, this, the coalition is only as meaningful as the participants who are here to create it. So we're calling all of you to join us. Innovators, leaders, entrepreneurs, change agents, problem solvers, community members, SMEs, to join us who, if you are impacted by the climate and disasters in the region or have a strong interest in building disaster resilience, please feel free to reach out. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Monica. This is such an important network you all are leading, um, and we look forward to continuing our work together. So I'm now going to provide an overview of the Business Resilience Challenge, but before we do that, we want to hear from you. So we're going to launch a poll. This will come up shortly in the bottom of your screen. And there are three questions here. The first asks, have you experienced a business disruption due to a natural disaster in the last 12 to 18 months? The second question asks, have you made investments in your business to try and mitigate those impacts in the future? And then finally, have you identified investment opportunities that would allow your business to be more sustainable and scalable in the aftermath or in preparing for natural disasters? So I'll be quiet now and let you all answer that poll. We already have some responses coming in. All right, so I can still see the results trickling in. I want to take a moment and ask if anyone would like to raise their hand and comment on the first question. So if they would like to expand on the kinds of business disruption experienced um, in the last 12 to 18 months, we would love to hear from you. So if, if you'd like to share, please raise your hand and uh, we'll enable your audio. Great, Rick, please go ahead. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so for the first question, yes, we have experienced um, interruptions in business due to, um, we had a, a storm, uh, well, it was actually a, a category one hurricane um, uh, within yeah within the last year, uh, which, which we had to stop you know, our operations and what we do, uh, we sell solar electricity. And um, that was also a, um, we were also afraid for, you know, our clients panels coming off the roof and stuff like that. But the, everything was okay in that nature, but there was a lot of rain. 
and but we didn't have to we did have to stop our our general wolf operations because of this thank you for sharing i imagine that was very difficult um and can i just ask a follow-up have you made investments in your business to try and mitigate those impacts for the future or sort of identified investment opportunities that would help with that yes so yeah our, my answers were yes to all of those i mean um what we what we plan to do is basically have uh, preparations for if we know that it's a, a category you know, within a one to three, then we can dispatch um, our installers to go out to assist clients in recouping the panels. But if we know it's a category four or five, and it all depends on the time frame. So, sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I was mute the whole time. Sorry. The we, we answered yes to all those questions. Um, however, what we have done is um, putting teams in place so that we can assist um, our, our clients to remove the panels if we have enough time based on the amount of, um, um, I should say, uh, skilled uh, workers that we do have available during that time to try and recoup some of the panels within a category one to four to three hurricane, but if it's a category four or five, where it's, then it would be more of an emergency to try and <clears throat> prepare ourselves because if it's a category five, four or five hurricane, then the panels wouldn't be significant. I mean, the roof may come off. So, um, so um, yeah, so that's what we've been doing, trying to put a, a team together to assist clients in that, in that nature. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing, that's very helpful. Does anyone else wanna come up uh, and share either about the disruption experience or some of the actions you're taking to uh, mitigate the impacts of these disruptions in the future? And Mackenzie is kindly sharing the results of our poll now. You can see um, you know, a little over 55% answered yes to the first question. Um, a little less um, than half are actually making investments in business to try to mitigate those impacts. And I think that's, you know, we'd like to understand why and also how we can help. And then finally, the last question is a 50-50 split. So, um, but we would love to hear from you. Does anyone else have thoughts on the business disruptions themselves and investment opportunities that would allow your business to be more sustainable and scalable? in the future. And again, if you have a comment, please uh, use the, the raise hand function. Okay, well, we can continue the discussion, but again, feel free at any point to please come off, um, raise your hand and we would like to hear from you. Oh, Joseph, please go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll take you off mute. That's um, Hurricane Maria and um... Uh, it completely destroyed um, our roof and um, some of the structure and uh, we had to re rebuild and we've been trying our best to do it the best way and the more resilient way. Um, and that has enabled us to um, develop a, a factory. And um, so we have a total factory that um, that requires a lot of more work uh, to make it more resilient and to, to be able to withstand even a, another hurricane, a category, category five hurricane. Um, this has helped us in terms of um, being able to plan our product, our, the development of our products, and you know to be able to have um, have um, the 
the quantities that are required for 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 marketing, especially the product that we produce, and um, and so we are looking for uh, export markets, not just in, in the Caribbean, like Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad, Barbados, Antigua, but also in the UK. Uh, I, we belong to the Dominica Herbal Business Association, so um, when we when we um, when we export something, say by DHL, we get a forty percent discount, you know, to to the to the market by DHL under an agreement with the um, Dominica Herbal Business Association, and um, but you know it is still a work in progress, and you know, uh, and and we need to be able to ensure that another Category Five hurricane will not be as disastrous as the one like Maria. Uh, but also we have been challenged by the pandemic. The, the pandemic has in, in, impacted us uh, tremendously. Uh, the, some of the markets that we were, uh, we were entering, we have lost. Uh, we are trying to re-enter them. For example, markets in, in, in Guyana and, and, and um, Suriname, which essentially are the two richest countries in the world at the moment per capita. So we are we're trying to get there. And uh, once we get there and with the support, and, and the support that we need can enable, enable us to get there. I think you know it will make us more self-reliant and more resilient uh, for any disaster. We don't. We we, we live close to the oh, factories close to the sea, about like say um, 40, 50 feet away from the sea. So we are always conscious of the of the need to um, to be awake, aware of what we are dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing. I, I think you know you all are making some really deliberate efforts. It's an interesting proposition, but as you mentioned, these things take time. Um, and you know your comment on the compounding impacts of the pandemic, re-entering markets, all of those things are challenging. Um, Joseph, we'd love to hear what business you're in, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, I'm involved in the production of Moringa products. I have five different products. Um, um, being manufactured in the factory um, is a, it's an agricultural product. So um, we are able to, to harvest like this morning. We had to go and harvest and we had to cancel it. It is not a disaster, <laughs> but, but you know, we had to cancel it for, to, to attend this webinar. And uh, because we have um, um, some orders that we are trying to fill and uh, so both clients in, in Dominica and some in Barbados and Antigua. So, um, but, but we need we need quite a bit of support to be able to to expand our, our our market initiatives. You know, we want to we have a product that is on Amazon, the first product from Dominica to be on Amazon, and uh, so that is working out because we have an agent in Florida. Um, we 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 are looking for other opportunities in the United States. You know, um, through. Costco and, and the other organizations, but we need to be able to, to reach out to them and to have the quantities that are required. Because once you identify the need for a product and you know and you have the market, then you know, it is your duty and our duty as, as a business to be ensure that you know we can meet those those quantities in in, in the in the in especially when people are waiting on you. For the products and you're, you're renegonic and you can't do it you know and that that is a challenge thank you joseph for expanding um, that's helpful context and yes can imagine that's certainly um challenging so we have two others with their hands raised uh let's go to lucius first and then alistair following hi good day and uh Thank you for allowing me to be on the platform. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. So um, when I when I'm I'm going to take like a slightly different approach because um, I'm thinking more of the service service sector. And when I think of like resilience and you know the opportunity to 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 gain like some level of financial support, I'm I'm thinking more more or less in the area of. Um, technical the technical capacity in terms of like when we're building capacity through like being able to hire consultants and 
is there financing available for things like that? Because sometimes, so for instance, with the pandemic, um, a lot of a lot of like the work was disrupted, and maybe you have staff or people that you're supposed to you you want to support, but these external shocks create um, well, they create hind hindrances like to your business model or what it is the market that you want to service and things like that, and you need basically access to funding that can allow you to probably stay afloat because probably the demand for your for your business or your service is not as as what it used to be before so i i'm i'm just trying to to understand whether or not this is an area when when you look at um the whole idea of resilience is that something that usaid is is willing to be a part of or to you know these types of initiatives because i um i have a startup company and it has to do with 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 consultant and uh, consulting and project management project design project planning and things of that nature but sometimes i feel like what i really need is i need probably somebody with complementary skills that i can probably hire but sometimes the funding is not readily available for me to sustain that type of um that type of activity but having somebody that can complement my business model would allow me to be more resilient in the face of whatever shocks or whatever it is so i'm, I'm really coming from that angle to see what opportunities exist and um yeah basically that that's what it is for me Thank you, Lucius. Um, thank you for sharing this. We've heard that access to capital is a big problem. And um, I would actually love to hear in the chat box if others have had challenges with access to capital. Um, I also want to mention that our business resilience challenge, which we'll hear more about, is sector agnostic. So we really do make a broad case for business resilience because we recognize um, there are a lot of factors that are very connected. So with that, let's go to Alistair. And Alistair, if you have a comment, yeah, we can hear sorry, you. sorry, I didn't realize my hand was up. Sorry. Oh, oh, that's okay, no problem. Do, do, uh, so you don't have a comment? No, no, not for now. I'm just kicking in until when I'm ready. I'll do something. No problem. Um, great. Let's go to Barbara, and then we'll move. Hello. To yes. Hi, Barbara. Hi. I, sorry, I wasn't the one who said hello um, initially, so I don't know if there was someone else who would like to speak, but um, I will go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, and good morning, um, everyone. I was driving and I missed the, in the welcome remarks, the, the very first remarks, uh, but I've been hearing everything since then. And uh, unfortunately, I have a meeting that's gonna start soon, but I just wanted to um, leave a, a note here that, um, and it's related to the previous column. I am a uh, consultant in a, a, a consultancy that is um, being uh, fund, co-funded by several UN agencies. Uh, and it's working through the, um, the ministry responsible for social protection. They're currently uh, reforming the social protection policy and uh, I have been hired, I'm an attorney at law. I have been hired to um, provide or, or to, 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 to draft the legislative framework to implement the social protection policy. Uh, what is significant, uh, which is why I, I wanted to share with you and to be on this call, is that we are coming up with the, the very same challenges that you mentioned here. Social protection is now seen as something broader. For example, the way the government apparently dealt with the pandemic uh, was you know, to, to assist with persons like the, the previous callers um, business, but uh, you know, persons in that situation was that they they took funds from 
the the social protection because at this point it was you know persons were made vulnerable by the pandemic by the loss of work by the shutdown and so this is the funds that were available and that caused an issue with the the persons who are normally vulnerable so the what is significant about the social protection policy and, and i think we may i would i would actually like to have a follow-up conversation with you is that social protection is now seen as something broader and cross-cultural. So vulnerable persons are not just vulnerable because they don't have a job in their life circumstances, but somebody could um, you know, be, have a strong business and be made vulnerable by a disaster uh, or be made vulnerable by a pandemic. And so the social protection policy is recognizing that. And the framework is, um, the legislative framework uh, seeks to ensure that the assistance possible is cross-sectoral, which means that instead of just one ministry, uh, the, the framework requires uh, uh, an enforceable collaboration across ministries and both public and private. And so from, um, from, from the legislative uh, point of view, what is required is a sustainable financing. Uh, and that's what, so I was very interested in, in this platform uh, that, that is here. I don't know too much about it. I read up a little bit and I heard some of the explanation this morning and I don't want to take up too much time because I can see that your focus is on disaster um, resilience, um, but the, you seem to face the same challenges in terms of trying to get a way to have a meaningful, cross-sector and uh, you know public-private partnership and so uh, you know I'm really interested in speaking to you because our project has stopped here you know how do we meet this challenge uh, and so I, I will leave my uh, you know contact information perhaps in the chat or by email so I got an email from Mr. Hammond can I respond to that with my contact email because I think your experience will be very useful for us uh, in terms of how we can how we can um, how we can set up you know, a sustainable finance that will deal with the various types of shocks that um, persons face either on a day-to-day -day basis or persons face suddenly um, through you know something like a pandemic or, or a climate event. Uh, I noticed Jared uh, has Jared Bagas has asked if it is deals with unemployment insurance. There's a there's a I have a, a legislative analysis report that explains what social protection involves and it's quite broad. And yes, it's a, it, it's the international best practice, which is um, which which can, you know is, is required for social protection. The international best practice states that it, it, you know, a country should include um, uh, an employment insurance. And so the legislative analysis report is currently under consultation. And so whoever wants, I can share the um, I can share the legislative analysis report with you and you know um, and get from here. But for this purposes, we are really interested in. At least I am not representing the government here. It's just me because I have this work. I'm trying to, to see, you know, an answer to this issue of sustainable financing and the cross-sectoral collaboration. So I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say something, and I will hand over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Barbara. We look forward to follow-up conversation. Absolutely. So now we're going to get into um, really the goal of the business resilience challenge. If we move to the next slide, great. So as we've discussed, um, in order to increase disaster resilience in the Eastern Caribbean, we really want to support ventures, public-private, civil partnerships, or other collaborations or organizations with revenue-generating models. So we want to make investments in businesses and communities to ultimately scale economic growth, encourage sustainability and of course, resilience. So what do we offer for potential applicants? We offer flexible accommodative finance options on terms that will be catered to your capital needs. Um, we offer assistance in creating bankable business proposals. I also noted there was something in the chat about business continuity uh, planning. We also offer um, assistance there. 
And then we'll be hosting a series of workshops and seminars that will allow you to grow your network. Um, they'll also provide useful and practical business advice and connections. So what do we mean when we say investments in resilience? Uh, the first point we want to make, again, is that we're sector agnostic. So we recognize disaster resilience requires a systemic uh, series of solutions. Sectors might include tourism, agriculture, renewables or decentralized energy, digital infrastructure, waste management. Um, and these investments can take many shapes, uh, but they might include activities like business continuity planning, digital upgrading, insurance, improved physical structures, and backup infrastructure. So we'll move to the next slide. And just, yeah, to as a reminder, our friends at DKI engaged in a robust discovery phase in partnership with many of you in the CCIR coalition. Um, and we've honed in on these areas of focus to enable systemic solutions to disaster resilience challenges, including the need for multi-sector coordination, business continuity planning, you know, support to employees, tech and financial services um, that allow for the continuation of business um, following a disaster or crisis, and then finally supply chain support across industry and cross island. So we um, will provide all the details you need on how to actually apply for the challenge, and we will give those parameters. Um, but first, in order to really expand on the importance of resilience investments in the Eastern Caribbean, we thought it would be great to highlight a case study um, of an organization that is an outstanding example of making deliberate investments in resilience and really highlights the impacts that's had. So again, this is just one aspect of what we mean by resilience. We wouldn't expect all uh, applicants to focus on supply chain, for example. Um, but I would like to now pass it to Gerard Bergas, the regional manager for St. Lucia Tropical Shipping, to give us a case study. Over to you, Gerard. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, Caroline, I'd like to thank CCIR for inviting me to share some of uh, Tropical's experience in dealing with um, disaster response through our region. We operate in nearly 30 ports from Halifax in Canada to Suriname and Guyana. So we've seen quite a few examples of this over the years. And um, we are, we are, we pride ourselves on being first responders. So today, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about supply chain resilience, especially in the context of disaster recovery, um, uh, COVID's disruptiveness and some of the global responses, the commonalities that we see post disaster and the impact on the supply chain. Some of the things that businesses do to successfully navigate disasters, lessons learned from post disaster recovery, and um, hopefully a couple of ideas to provoke thought, some thought, especially with respect to investing. I'm hoping that when I'm done, I would have built a case for investment in, in resilience, not just in plant and infrastructure, but also people and processes and a partnership with government. So can you go to the next slide, please? Oops. Uh, the last couple of years have been very trying for everyone. Um, COVID-19 COVID was a huge disruptor for economies and societies globally, and it's still playing out now. Supply chain problems that are now a consequence of COVID disruption. However, the reasons behind that are not the focus for today. Um, the the, the conditions, those conditions of the disruption to the supply chain have, have um, precipitated reassessment of risk generally um, and questions of how we measure our resilience, try to determine you know, what actions we need to take to make ourselves more resilient, attempts to future-proof supply chains. Um, and although I am sure pandemics are quite likely identified as vul vulnerabilities in, in BCPs all over the region, COVID still took the world by surprise. 
And, and so we, we need to get to a place where we are anticipating um, sudden unforeseen events. Next slide. So this is just a, a framework for looking at the different types of events that we see. And it, it, the, it's a very simple uh, matrix and it draws attention to costs. So the, the Caribbean is familiar with acute climate events, which sort of is in the middle of the chart there. And pandemics are up at the top right corner. So we generally are better at mitigating events on in the bottom left quadrant. Next slide. Caroline, you let me know if I'm going a little too fast. You're doing great, thanks, Troy. Okay. COVID was, was so disruptive and the current impacts on the global supply chain have, has, has forced us into changing the way we do things as businesses and governments. Uh, a recent study by the European Roundtable for Industry found that businesses generally, as a result, have more plan Bs now in place. So they've, they've, they're trying to work out alternatives for supply chains or particularly risky elements of the supply chain um, and building strategies that would, would help make them more resilient and make their supply chains more resilient. Policy makers as well are also considering supply chain resilience in trade policy and in trade negotiations. The US, Britain, U the European Union, Japan, Mexico are all uh, doing that, that sort of thing. They are building um, supply chain resilience into their trade policy negotiations with other countries. Um, studying uh, supply chain vulnerabilities to get data to inform those policy decisions. And we've all heard about nearshoring or friend shoring or domestic supply. Um, this is a big uh, hot item in the US right now. And um, the, the idea there is to sharpen the defensive tools against foreign subsidies by trying to nearshore or, or domestic or domestic supply for critical parts of the supply chain. All these things we see playing out around the world right now. Individual businesses uh, cannot materially affect these government policies, but should understand the impact that they might have on their own supply chains. And you know the, the general message here for businesses, anticipate and prepare. So next slide. So switching gears a little bit, I just want to talk a little bit about cost. Um, uh, disruptions and disasters are very costly for, for the economy and the business operating within it. And I heard, I think it was Nakasi said that, that um, the cost of, of, of um, disasters in the Caribbean is about 17% of GDP. Well, actually, Maria cost Dominica 226% of its GDP. Now, put that into context, it would take Dominica five years to recover from, from Maria. So these disasters and disruptions to the economy, economies of the region are very, very expensive. Next slide. So this is a, a, a look at cost as a percentage of GDP. And it's just a sampling of, of various disasters that have happened through the region. And if nothing else, this slide should tell you that these disasters are extremely costly to our region. And there you see on the right-hand side, Maria in Dominica. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is a slightly different perspective on cost. And what this slide is showing you is that middle income earners are generally the ones hardest hit when disasters strike. And this is the group of people that are likely most depended upon 
to get the economy going again after a disaster. So that's not a good, that's not a good thing. So next slide. So the last, last point I wanted to make on cost is that um, the speed of recovery matters. And this slide shows that there, there are actually sort of three phases uh, to full recovery in, um, in, any, in any one of our countries. The first phase is really the relief, where you get a lot of relief coming in. Then the next phase is the recovery. And then the last phase is the reconstruction. But the, the message that I want to leave you with here is that speed matters. Recovery is an absolutely urgent matter. The longer it takes to recover, the more pain and suffering is experienced by the nation. Next slide, please. So although each event in each country has its own set of peculiarities, uh, studies have shown that there are commonalities. And those commonalities uh, are things like constrained resources. This is, this is more frequent on the distribution side than on the production side. Um, and often businesses are competing with the public sector for the same resources. And a great example of that is the business that we're in, which is transportation and logistics. Personnel and labor shortages. And it's particularly bad when employees themselves become victims of, dis of a disaster because if they are victims, they can't work and they can't help the recovery effort. And um, damage to critical infrastructure, ports, roads, hospitals, et cetera. The unsolicited and poorly managed aid, aid flows. And we can talk a lot more about this, but um, that's not the focus here today. Uh, adequate pre-event vulnerability analysis. And this, this again, it, it speaks to looking at the impacts of different types of events on the supply chain and on the business and putting plans in place to build in resilience, to invest in the resilience upfront so that you, you mitigate the impact post disaster. Big companies are generally um, better placed to do this and to invest um, in business continuity planning and partnerships with governments and employee assistance programs and allocating resources to harden or back up critical systems. The, the unfortunate converse of that is, is also true, that smaller businesses are not well placed to do that. And so generally a much harder hit. And there's a little statistic that um, gets bandied around quite a bit that one in four businesses just never recover after a, a disaster. And that is, that's a telling statistic. Next slide, please. So uh, going forward, uh, a focus should be on engagement at the national level, the community level, and the business level with stakeholders in our supply chains. Define the infrastructure that is critical to supply chain resilience. For example, ports, roads, bridges, hospitals, security forces, utilities, et cetera. Um, and ensure that the, the national emergency plan addresses the needed infrastructure. Now, I, I know we all have versions of new um, in our various countries, but businesses need to, need to understand that they need to have an input into that because it is ultimately their business that will suffer if the national plan is inadequate. And so there is a, a, an obligation for businesses to engage in, in that, in that um, planning with the governments. Um, as, as a further example, you know, power and telecom are predictable vulnerabilities in, in disasters, but their resilience often determines the recovery speed of the supply chain. So these are things that businesses should be aware of and be advocating for or putting 
plans in place or investing in resilience that they can continue to communicate post-disaster. Next slide. At a business level, there, there are a few considerations that we think are important to supply chain resilience. And we look at each of these in more, in more detail. But um, first and possibly the most important is to build a culture of preparedness. Um, next slide. Thanks. So the, a, a key thing here in building that culture of preparedness is to train, 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 train. It is, it is in really important for businesses to truly understand how supply and demand drive the flows of critical goods and services into their country, into their area, and how a particular event can affect those flows. Any interdependencies between the different parts of the supply chain are also very important to understand. Inventory and lead times post-event. This, this businesses need to understand that supply chain capacity is determined by the bottlenecks in your supply lines. So you need to know where those bottlenecks are. Responsiveness is determined by those lead times. So plan for contingencies. Test your BCP very, very regularly. And again, this is, this is an investment upfront so that you are better able to cope post-disaster. I just wanted to give you one example here on, next slide, sorry, of a company that really got it right, and that was P&G. I mean, you can, you can read this slide, but they post um, Hurricane Katrina, P&G was able to respond and uh, what really was the, the crux of their ability to do this is that they, they had inculcated right through the entire organization this culture of preparedness. So they tested their BCP, they put um, alternate um, supply lines in place. They, they really had an amazing response to Katrina. And this is a, Katrina, sorry. And this is a, this is a great example of a company that, that did it right. So uh, next slide, please. So just a couple of ideas um, for financial preparedness. You know, in business, uh, the most fundamental part of business is the buy-sell transaction. If we cannot receive money for what we sell and make payments for what we need to buy, we will go out of business. So the, the message here is look at investing in alternative payment and money transfer platforms. Make sure that that part of your supply chain, that part of your business is resilient. Um, you, if you cannot pay your staff and if they cannot provide for their families, they won't come to work, which means your business won't recover. Uh, you need to be able to pay your suppliers, including tropical shipping and freight, and um, government payments, customs, ports, ministries, et cetera. So this, this idea, this is just one aspect. There are many other things with financial preparedness, but this idea of, of investing in, in a resilient uh, platform to allow you to make payments and receive payments. Uh, next slide. And last, I wanted to leave you with this one, um, which is the idea of digitizing your, your company records. And I'm not just talking about um, your back office system, but uh, which is your financial records, but your, your records with respect to your, your suppliers, your leases, your titles for property, et cetera. Because uh, if, you know, if you are in a storm vulnerable area and your roof gets blown off, like Mr. Peltier said earlier, 
and your office gets flooded, you could lose all of these very valuable legal documents. And that will just take you a lot longer to, to recover. So invest in, in looking at digitizing those records and keeping them perhaps in the cloud where they, where they are less vulnerable to local, uh, local disasters. And next slide. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I would be happy to, to talk. I could talk a lot more about this, but um, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you, Gerard. That was super helpful. Um, and as you mentioned, please drop your questions um, in the Q&A box and we'll make sure to um, answer as many of those as we can. So now we're getting to the fun part. Um, this is the how to apply section for the Eastern Caribbean Resilience Challenge. So I will um, pass it to my colleagues. Uh, Somia Krishnamurthy, the Director for Partnerships and Sustainable in Initiatives with PADF, and Madeline St. John, the Program Coordinator for Partnerships and Sustainable Finance Initiatives. So over to you both. Thank you, Caroline. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've been loving hearing about your individual businesses, your challenges you've already encountered, the solutions you've identified. So we're excited to walk you through uh, the application process. And, and we, we would love to hear from you too as to what you think about the process and if you have any questions or comments along the way. Uh, I want to start off by giving a huge thank you and shout out to our referral partners on the ground in St. Lucia. You see their, their names and logos on the slide, but I cannot stress enough how important it is for our initiative to be embedded in the local ecosystem. These organizations are already doing great work in promoting business resilience and overall resilience and disaster risk reduction measures on island. Um, and we count on them to, to bring in more partners, more applicants, um, and more technical or financial support support providers to our initiative. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to do over the next few slides is just walk you through the practical nuts and bolts of what the application is going to be looking for, what the phases are, what the eligibility criteria are. Uh, and it won't be exhaustive, so please keep the questions coming if anything we say is unclear or you have some suggestions or ideas for us to consider. Uh, on this page, which is hosted on USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance website, you'll see the overall goals of the Eastern Caribbean Business Resilience Challenge. What are some of the things we're looking for? How we propose to support you in your application process? Uh, it's a process through which you're going to go through some phases that I'll walk you through, but know that each, each response that you provide to the questions is carefully considered. Uh, we're looking really to invest to increase the disaster resilience and overall business resilience of the region. Next slide, please. So who are we looking to target with our initiative? If you're a small and medium-sized enterprise, or even if you're a large enterprise and you're considering making investments in business resilience, then this is the mechanism for you. Uh, we're also looking to target public-private or public-civil or private-civil partnerships, anything that might have a revenue stream. And other organizations that might not fall neatly into either of these categories, if you're an organization with a revenue or financial stream that will produce a rate of return, then the blended finance mechanism might be a way for you to fund your investments and in resilience. Next slide, please. So the eligibility criteria for this round, so this is just launched in St. Lucia. We intend to have a more regional launch later. Um, this Saint, for this launch, you have to be operating in St. Lucia. You must have an idea that could increase your business and or community resilience. I want to stress this. Many businesses are often the cornerstone of their community's paths to relief, recovery, and reconstruction that Gerard pointed out. So if you're a business and you're planning an initiative that could have a huge impact on the community around you, then we're interested in hearing from you. Uh, if your business or your idea is able to generate financial returns, and you're able to provide some historical financial information and or a track record of success as an entrepreneur or an enterprise, we want to hear from you. So these are the very basic eligibility criteria. And as we said earlier, we're sector agnostic, we're size agnostic. So please apply if you think you've got an idea you've been sitting on for a while and could really use it to boost resilience. Next slide, please. 
The application process for St. Lucia is broken up into three phases. Two of those phases are required. The third one is optional. Uh, and don't worry, entirely through every step of the way, we're here to help support you. Uh, we want to make this as uh, user-friendly and undaunting, if I'm making up a word, forgive me, as possible. Uh, but it's broken up into two, two main phases. The first is a concept note, which I'm going to walk you through in full detail. And then there is an application that follows. Um, the concept note is really just an, a way for us to get a sense of what idea you're planning, a little bit of background information about who you are and where you plan to go with this idea. And then the full application is a much more detailed readout. And we'll get, get into those details in just a minute. Next slide, please. So if at any point in this in this process, whether it's at the concept note stage, whether it's at the full application stage, whether you decide to go for a pitch session, or even if you're just contemplating an idea and you, you're struggling with putting your ideas down on paper, we have support. And when we say we have support, we have support from experts on island. We have support from experts in the region ready to, to help you with this. So office hours are available. There's a form. We're going to drop this link in the chat. Uh, you know, please sign up. Uh, you know, let us know what topics you're interested in. If we're not providing support in an area that you think needs support, we'll, we'll be happy to, to accommodate. Next slide, please. So when can you apply? The application itself opened up on July 27th, but it's on a rolling basis. So we're treating applications as they come in on a first come first serve. We're holding the application process open, at least for the first phase. That is, you can get in your concept notes, your ideas, all the way until September 23rd. But I did say rolling, so I encourage all of you to apply as early as possible. You definitely wanna want to take the time to build out your idea, access all the wonderful support we have to offer, and get yourself first in line for funding considerations. So uh, you have till September 23rd, but I encourage you to apply today. Next slide, please. So what is the concept note itself? Uh, it's, it's a very simple, well, we think it's simple. We'd love to hear from you after you've had a chance to fill it out. Uh, a, a basic way to get from you some, some very, very preliminary information about who you are, what your business does, what you're looking to do, and how you fit into the, into the broad ecosystem of disaster resilience in St. Lucia. So let's, let's get through the questions and let us know at any point if anything is unclear. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with a very basic get to know you, you know, where are you based in St. Lucia, because that's, uh, are you operating in St. Lucia rather, you can be based anywhere in the region, we want to know about that, we want to know what size you might be, we want to know if you're women owned or women led, uh, and you know what sector you might fall into. Again, we're sector agnostic and size agnostic, so none of your responses to these questions are going to sway us one way or the other. Next way, next slide please. Then we want to know a little bit more about what you're looking to get out of it. As my colleague Monica pointed out earlier, there is a broader coalition initiative underway. So maybe your idea for resilience might only need partnerships and connections to get it off to the next stage. But maybe you do need funding. Maybe you need both. Often ideas don't come fully formed at the first stage. So let us know if any of these things might be interesting to you and we'll make sure you're connected to the right resources. Uh, I also pointed out our, our wonderful referral partners at the beginning. So if any of them were the reason you heard about this mechanism, please let us know. We would love to thank them for their support. Um, and then we get to hear a little bit more about you. Tell us what you do. Tell us why you wake up every day. What is your business about? What is your idea about? What is your partnership about? And then tell us anything that might be important for us to understand you a little bit better. The gentleman who spoke earlier talked about Moringa. We know how important that is as a superfood. We know that that's a, that's a sector in agribusiness that's hugely promising for the region. So we want to know these cool things about you. So let's let us know about them. And, and we've given you 500 words. We hope that's enough. Sometimes it's not. So let us know if you need more, more space too. Uh, next slide, please. Then we want to know what you're hoping to get out of this process. What do you think, what is, what is your idea and how will you implement it? What new activities will you undertake? What new partnerships are you seeking? And what, what will happen at the end of this if you're successful? So give us a, give us a, a brief sense of your vision for where you're going. Next slide, please. 
we pointed out some areas, challenge areas early on. My, Carol my colleague Caroline put them up. These were challenge areas that came up through detailed engagement with stakeholders. This is where we think that business resilience um, initiatives might fall under, but they may not apply to you. So if one of these applies to you, please let us know. If it doesn't, and you're, you're in interested in investing in resilience in another space, let us know that too. We're just curious to see where you fall into this ecosystem. And then tell us how your new activities, if you do select one of those challenge areas or you let us know it's an other, tell us how your activities are going to contribute to, uh, to the challenge area that's been identified about. So we can have a clear understanding of how your idea might fit into the broader challenge. Next step, please. Next slide, please. Uh, then we're going to get into the questions about money. Tell us about how you use these funds to improve your business's ability to bounce back. How are you going to contribute? How is the funding specifically going to contribute to the improvements in resilience, either in your business or in your community or both? And then tell us what's your timeline to carry this out? We need to understand a little bit more about what deliverables we might look along the way and what your projected deadlines to achieving those deliverables might be. Next slide, please. And this, this, this application window in St. Lucia is open to receive funding requests all the way up to $100,000. It's a blended finance mechanism. So tell us a little bit about how much funding you're seeking for your, for your idea. And then uh, what is the kind of funding that you think this falls under? Is it, a, is it seed capital, trade finance, working capital? Are you interested in purchasing equipment? You need to make some improvements to infrastructure or is it something else entirely? Give us a little sense of what that funding uh, category might be. Next slide, please. And then we want to know a little bit about your background. So uh, tell us about you know, what your revenues and profits might have been for the last three fiscal years. We're just looking for basic information at this point, And we understand that COVID was hard for businesses across the spectrum. So this, again, not a question to penalize you. We just want to get to know you better. Uh, so please share with us. And then when, you, when you're flagged for the full application, we'll be getting into more details on financial statements. My colleague Madeline will go through them. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this set of questions are really optional, but we hope you take the time to fill them out. This is about us understanding where you fit into the disaster resilience and business resilience ecosystem in St. Lucia. We want to know uh, what your experiences have been with with projects like this, or even initiatives, or what you're you know what you're what you're thinking about. So none of the questions related to this are going to be counted towards your particular application. It's merely helping us understand the ecosystem a little better and make sure as we iteratively refine the process for applications that we're taking your responses into consideration. So these are freebie questions. They're like the ones that don't count on the SATs. Uh, so please just share with us what you can. Um, next slide, please. So how are we going to evaluate the concept note that's come in? Uh, we think it's a fairly simple criteria. The first one is whether we can see from your responses a clear contribution to disaster resilience. Uh, this could be in the relief phase, it could be in the recovery phase, it could be in reconstruction, it could be in disaster risk reduction, uh, but really we just want to see a clear con connection. We want to know that you have a clear plan in place. You, you have a real good idea of what you want to do and how you're going to get there. And then we want to see that those ideas is, are grounded in reality with clear correlation between what you're seeking for us to fund and what your project plan is. So these points are distributed three, four, and one. And then of course, there are always bonus points to keep things interesting. So if you do, if you do feel like your idea addresses one of the key challenge areas, you get a bonus point for that. And if you're women-owned or women-led enterprise or initiative, then you'll get a bonus point for that as well. Uh, for a total possible of 10 points with additional um, with additional factors. So with that, uh, I think I turn it over to my colleague, Madeline St. John, but can I just check the next slide, please, to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn? Yeah, oh, yes, this is very important. This is the famous Madeline that you're gonna hear from. 
but uh, these, this is a Google form, so it's easier to fill it out if you have a Google account. If you do, please sign in into your Google account so that allows you to save your progress. You can come back to it at any point. You don't have to finish it all in one go. If you want to have a preview of the full set of questions, then there is also a PDF version, and we're going to drop all these links in the chat. You can download the PDF version and kind of test your answers out. Run it by a friend or a colleague or a family member. Make sure it makes sense before you have to actually commit to filling out the application. And we know technology fails everyone. So at any point, if none of this is working for you, you can just complete the PDF and email it to mstjohn at padf.org. And also use that same email address if you have any questions, you're stuck along the way, you need a little help, we're eager to hear from you. And with that, I'm actually turning it over to Madeline. And thank you all so much for your time and participation today. Thank you, Somia. Um, so just to reiterate something that's already been said in the chat, for those of you who are wondering, this recording will be shared um, if any of you have to hop off at any point. Um, now I'll give you a brief overview of the full application process, which is the next stage after the concept note. We could go to the next slide. Um, and the, the next slide after that. So within two weeks of submitting your concept note, um, we, it will be reviewed. If it meets the requirements and moves forward in the process, then we will share with you the link to the full application stage. And at that stage, you will have until October 15th to complete the full application. So we recommend that the sooner that you're able to submit the concept note, the better, um, in part because it will increase the amount of time that you will have to um, complete the full application, which is a more detailed application where we will be requesting um, further information. But as Somia uh, mentioned, like through the concept note process, there will be resources available to support you throughout that process. So we hope it um, that will help to facilitate that completing that more detailed application. Um, next slide, please. So for this, this application, um, the main ideas behind the information that we'll be looking for is to get an idea of your capacity of your business or organization, as well as your financials um, and the impact that your project will have either on your business or community resilience. Um, and here on the slide, you can see what those sections of the more detailed application would be. Um, and you would be able to preview them before completing the application as well. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, for the full application, um, there will be some training sessions and office hours available for all of the applicants. Um, you would be registered for financial training sessions once you complete your concept note, um, and then there will also be office hours available to assist in, in completing the, the full application. And then the exciting part, after your full application is selected, you would receive a disbursement of funds and also have the opportunity to access further technical assistance. Um, next slide, please. And then this would be followed by an optional pitch session as well as other matchmaking or networking opportunities. And finally, I wanted to highlight the upcoming training sessions. We hope that you will be able to join us and sign up. They're open to anyone. They're particularly geared towards applicants or potential future applicants to the challenge, but they are um, free and open to anyone who's interested in registering. So Mackenzie will be dropping the links in the chat um, as we go through these. But the first one is coming up um, on, actually, this should say Friday, not Tuesday. Um, this, this Friday afternoon, there's a training session with Cheryl Griffith um, from Business Continuity Management Services and Barbados, and she'll be talking about um, the importance of business continuity awareness and how you can apply it to your enterprise and create a simple business continuity plan. Um, 
Next slide, please. And then on Wednesday, September 7th, Donna Rosa from E4 Enterprises um, will be presenting on business plans and how to create a business plan, what are the key elements, uh, how you can do it in a pretty, pretty simple step-by-step -step process, as well as some tools that she's developed um, through her enterprise and that can simplify the task of writing business plan or generating financial statements. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, we have a series of training sessions taking place throughout September with very, very, very impressive professionals from St. Lucia who will be presenting on digital marketing, becoming export ready and accessing new markets, as well as crafting an in investment pitch. And this final uh, training session with Trisha Leo on crafting an investment pitch will also be combined uh, with a financial training on um, calculating return on investment, generating the financial statements, some of those key parts of the full application um, with Annie Bertrand, who's previously um, worked with C Compete Caribbean and Caribbean Export. She's based in Barbados and has a lot of capacity building and training experience. Um, and she'll be conducting financial training part one and part two, uh, the week of September 27th. And so we hope that you'll check out the sessions and sign up and that they'll be useful in completing the application process as well as thinking about some of these concepts more generally. And if you have any suggestions for potential future types of training that you would like to see or that you think would be um, helpful going forward. We also hope that you'll fill in the survey um, that we'll put a, the link in the chat uh, to to give us some feedback in that regard as well. And I'll turn it back over to Caroline for the question and answer session. Wonderful. So we've had a lot of great uh, questions that have come through in the chat box and um, in the Q&A, but Wanted to now just open the floor so if anyone else has questions on the application process, um, please feel free to use the raise hand function and we will um, enable you to come off mute and speak. Uh, Nelson in the chat asked, when will this opportunity be replicated in Dominica? Um, so just to say, Nelson, that the, the idea is to do a pilot in St. Lucia, um, but then we will have a wider regional launch. So um, following St. Lucia, we won't go country by country, but I'll pause there. Madeline, anything you want to add to that? I think just what we um, had dropped in the chat, please follow us on Facebook to receive any updates on future um, opportunities and, and funding windows and when the challenge will be open in your country and hopefully will be soon. Great. And we just had a question come in from Michelle. Um, is there a template provided to follow since this is a somewhat new initiative? Um, Michelle, are, are you talking about the application process specifically or um, for the sort of activity as a whole? The application process. Yes, um, I'll jump in and answer that, Caroline. Yes, thank you, Michelle. There is, uh, you can preview the concept notes and that's the PDF link that we dropped in the chat. And if you're selected to complete the full application, then you'll also have a chance to preview that. You'll be given a link and you can go to that link and you'll be able to see every, every part of the full application that you'll be asked to fill out and you'll have plenty of time to, to look at it, seek help if you need to and complete the application. So PDFs are going to be your friend. All of our previews are on PDF. 
because you can use them to also um, print them out or you can you can fill them out directly in the PDF and that makes that we found that that makes it easier. But if you have suggestions for us on how we can do that better, please do let us know. We're all yours. Great, thank you, Somia. And uh, thank you, Michelle, for the question. We'll also, we'll drop the, the link for the PDF um, application form in the chat one more time. Derek, please go ahead. Hey, Caroline, can you, um, can you hear me? Yes, we gotcha. I was just gonna point out one thing, which is people should think uh, in terms of scalable investments. So don't think in terms of piecemeal funding, um, Caroline, I don't know. If, I don't think we specified the size of funding and that kind of thing. But the idea here is that when you spend all your time developing a business case uh, and the funding that's needed to support that business case, you might as well think about the right size of funding as well, so that it really makes a difference to your your initiative or your or your uh, your business's resilience now and going forward. So I just wanted to make that point. So think large within a bandwidth of um, anywhere from $30,000, $35,000 to up to $100,000. And of course, if that's not exactly what you need, then think about things in terms of tranches. So if it's 30,000 that we need or 50,000 that we need, how can we divide that into logical phasings of funding that we need so that you, you have your application submitted with the, the overall vision of what you need in terms of capital and then the timing of capital so that it works uh, the best for you so that your efforts are actually most efficient. That's it, Caroline. Thanks, Derek. Yes. And we just, um, Joseph chatted in um, asking if applications from Dominica will be entertained at another time. Um, that is correct. So Mackenzie dropped a link into our Facebook page where we'll announce the exact dates of the regional launch, uh, which will follow, follow the pilot in St. Lucia. And I'll pause there, um, Samir Madeline, if there's anything to add on that point. No, you covered it. Just want to reiterate for everyone. Um, we're, we're launching in St. Lucia, but we're, we're definitely going to go for a regional launch soon after. So just give us time to get through the process of St. Lucia. Uh, we're accepting ideas and concepts in St. Lucia all the way through September 23rd. Uh, the final date that we mentioned for the full application process to come to an end in St. Lucia is currently targeted to be uh, October 15th. So we'll take two weeks after that to finalize all of the, the back end paperwork, the funding decisions, the disbursements, et cetera. And then we're moving on to the regional launch. So our best estimate for you at this time is towards the end of this year or in the early, early part of next year. So December, Jan is our target timeframe, but we'll definitely be posting periodic updates on Facebook and other social media accounts. So please follow us. Thank you, Somia. And just to mention the reason we chose St. Lucia as a pilot, um, we actually heard from the CCIR network that it would be valuable to roll out a, a pilot program or sort of a proof of concept before taking it to the broader region. Um, and St. Lucia is sort of in the middle when it comes to GDP, uh, when it comes to the impacts of disasters and other climate related events on the region. So we thought this is a great opportunity to gather data to learn um, and then apply those learnings to the wider regional approach. Other questions? Uh, great, I see a question in the chat from Nikisha asking, would startup funding be a part of this initiative? Um, so Derek, please go ahead. Yeah, so the, it's, um... It's not necessarily the way Caroline, I think you described it earlier, we're, we're going to look at applications coming in. And if we feel as though startup funding um, has a, a wider impact on resilience in a value chain, for example, so the entity that's being startup funded has a value, a, a, a larger linkage to the, um, the value chain that it's a part of. We'll take a look at that. And I think uh, Samia mentioned that we have our partners um, at GKI that are also involved in some initiatives. So we're working to basically be able to entertain a range of, of uh, companies at various life cycles. We're not necessarily though in the, in, at the level of incubator um, type of funding, 
but sometimes startup funding means you've started to generate some revenue, but you want to scale and you don't have the wherewithal or the technical know-how to scale. And of course, if that's part of your proposition and your need, then we will actually be able to supply you with resources to do that. So it's 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 not a black or, or white sort of ish, uh, response. It's something that I, su I suggest you submit a concept note and you let us uh, decide from that point. Great, and Derek, um, while I have you, there's a question on interest rates. Any thoughts on what the interest rate? <laughs> I, yeah, that's come. That's come. That's come. That's come in a couple of times now. The 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 uh, the very straightforward answer is that we're providing capital. That's um, it, by blending finance. The notion is that if an interest rate is at a very high level. And there is a way to lower the general market interest rate to something that's lower by blending sources of finance. That's what our mechanism does. So what you can be assured of is that our interest rates will be designed to be lower than what you would be getting from a, a general arm's length type of lending arrangement. So that's that's the positive part. And that's why blended finance is so important. The second piece of it um, is that blending finance also provides you with more accommodative capital structures, such as repayment of the debt the timing of amortization and all those kinds of things. So you, the, the cost of interest, the amortization, the structure, all of those things are going to be designed into what we believe would be the right structure. The, um, the interest rate has not been determined yet, but uh, the punchline is that it'll be uh, at a rate that'll be more accommodative than say just straight out uh, commercial non-blended interest rates. Wonderful. And so I, I realize we're at time. I wanna just, move to the final slide and thank you all for your participation and valuable contributions. Again, the application deadline for concept notes is Friday, September 23rd. Um, for those that are able to stay on, we have one more question in the Q&A. So um, just wanted to, to close by thanking you all. And with that, for anyone that's able to stay on, I see um, Jamal and Grace have asked a question on sort of how we're defining resilience. So I will pass that to you, Somia. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that great question. We're, we're, we've seen some examples of what resilience could be, but we don't want to want this to be uh, restrictive. So if resilience in your case, in your business, in your sector means it's greater connections, new access to markets, strengthening your supply chain by, by di diversifying your producers, then absolutely, then we count that as a case for resilience. So we really expect uh, that you're the experts in your businesses, in your sectors, and in your region. So you tell us how you think this idea strengthens the overall resilience proposition, and, and we'll be happy to defer to you on that. Thank you, Somia. Very helpful. And with that, we'll move to our, our final slide, just again to say thank you so much for all of your input, for your questions. Um, you can see the Facebook page there, and, and we also have dropped it in the chat. That's where we'll be um, communicating updates. Um, again, as we eventually launch the regional approach, it's also where we'll send reminders for the St. Lucia pilot. But thank you all for your time. Mackenzie's dropping the link for the application in the chat one more, one more time. Um, and thank you so much. We're very excited for this important initiative. Uh, and don't hesitate to follow up with our team um, for any additional questions. And we look forward to speaking with you.